on Feb 1 last year, that's 2022, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman announced the setting up of an expert committee to study and suggest changes to remove end-to-end -end friction in regulation and taxes for India's P and VC investors. The committee was also mandated to identify potential accelerants to make India a top investment destination. As we head towards Budget 2023, the committee has not only been set up, but it's also submitted its report to the Finance Minister. In fact, the Indian Venture and Alternative Capital Association, or IVCA, met the committee and flagged off as many as 160 issues that required reform, particularly the long-standing ones, such as the disparity in long-term capital gains tax on the sale of unlisted versus listed shares, the double taxation of ESOPs, and the urgent need to put to work large unused pools of domestic capital, among many others. As we said, these were only a few of the demands in a list that is quite long, but what is encouraging is, before submitting the report, the committee's chairperson, M. Damodran, told CNBC TV 18 in an exclusive interview that the committee has indeed taken a hard look at the regulations that are perhaps past their sell-by date. So there is hope that this year's budget could put in place more accelerants for the Indian startup ecosystem, more so after the previous year's budget, which was called a Budget for Digital India. This year, the Finance Minister could once again look at giving a impetus across sectors from agriculture and healthcare to education and financial inclusion. With exactly a week to go to the budget speech on the 1st of February, let's hear out what startups and investors want from Budget 2023. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Pan. To take this discussion forward, we're now joined by Gopal Srinivasan, the chairman and MD of TVS Capital Funds, Rema Subramanian, the co-founder and managing partner at Ankur Capital, and Vineet Rai, the founder and chairman of Avishkar Group. Uh, gentlemen and Rima, many thanks for joining us here on the program. Mr. Srinivasan, let me start by asking you, the big expectation and hope at this point in time is that the Damodran Committee's recommendations will find their way into Budget 2020. As we pointed out, Mr. Damodran, in an interview with CNBC TV 18, has said that the committee has looked into regulations that are past their sell date, past their expiry date. Now, we don't know what the finance minister will unveil, but of the long list uh, of, uh, of issues that the IVCA identified, and 160 of them, you know, what are the top things that you would be happy with if they go through? Shari, thank you for having all of us on the show. You know, this is the 10th year of the AIF industry. And if you go back from the beginning to now, it's grown at close to 100% CAGR from 2012 to today. So it's a very important landmark for us at 7 lakh crore, 7 trillion rupees of total commitments made to the AIF 1 and 2 industry approximately, that this can be a budget where we can signal that we recognize the AIF industry to be as integral to all laws, whether it's tax or company affairs or any other law, as mutual funds have or NBFCs are. That is probably at a philosophical level, the one that we want to really see, that we are an industry, mm. we represent 7 lakh crore or 7 trillion rupees or 2.5% of GDP, whichever number you wish, as part of the overall fabric of providing risk capital, risk equity capital particularly, and risk debt capital also to the industry. So the number one wish for us is that we and the mm -hmm. public markets should be seen exactly on the same lines as far as long-term capital gains is concerned. Our second wish is that mm. the business model of the AIF industry, for example, carried interest, is not, is it, by interpretation yeah. of law, it is capital gains, but it is not called out and therefore leaving it to some young assessing officer in Kanpur or in Coimbatore to actually decide whether this is capital gains or not. So we want the elements of the AIF design to be baked into tax law. For example, in an AIF, the, we buy a share for 100, but actually the commitment we receive from the investors 120 because those are the additional efforts and expenses. But it's not carried at 120 as it should be if it's passed through, but it's taken as 100. So it's things like that, what we call the elements of our design to be baked into law. If these two happen in a budget which is likely to be one to signal stability in a pre-election year, we do hope that this will be the not the digital India budget. This will be the promote, this will be the Atman Irbar AIF budget for promotion of risk capital in India. I'm sure they will come with a cleverer name than that, but that's what we really need. Uh, you know, in terms of reducing friction, in terms of accelerating growth, supporting 
supporting the startup ecosystem? What what is what do you believe the budget can do? So uh, thanks, Sri, and I think uh, Gopal has covered some of the very important points. But I think one thing that probably uh, government can do and can do very quickly is to acknowledge that uh, we are living through very troubled times, troubling times, and recession globally may mean, <clears throat> and India needs to grow while the world is at recession. That means you need to actually find ways of supporting uh, the AIFs who actually have 80% of their capital coming from foreign shores. Now, when a country as large as ours, uh, where our ambitions are to go from roughly uh, in, uh, 80 billion odd dollars, seven lakh crores, uh, to to let's say 450 billion or maybe a trillion dollars, roughly 20 percent of the GDP five years, seven years down the line. Uh, the domestic capital has to play a very very important role, and uh, the budget should and must uh, play a significant role in opening up uh, the coffers of the uh, insurance agencies, the 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 large capital that is lying with the government. Uh, and it's not that government has not tried, but it has still been much, much at a much smaller scale. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that takes away from the 10,000 crores should be fund of fund or the 50,000 crores uh, fund of fund under the self-reliant India, uh, or even the 1,000 crore NABARD fund of fund for agri uh, blended finance, under blended finance structures. Uh, but there is much needs, much more needs to be done for uh, us to find a balance between the foreign capital and the domestic capital. You know, speaking about this balance being between foreign capital and domestic capital, and Gopal Srinivasan, I want to come back to you because, again, this has been something that we have discussed for long here uh, on this show. And, you know, people like you and Mohanda Spy have put forward suggestions on how the government should look at unlocking value uh, and domestic capital as well. Um, again, on that, you know, to, to Vineet's point, let's be specific. What is it that you realistically expect and what would you be... Uh, you know, what would you be happy with if it goes through? So, Shireen, we must first accept the fact that we are in an emerging state of the AIF industry. If what we should be doing and what we are doing are at being maybe at a 30-40% stage of development, which means still when domestic LPs evaluate us, let us say an uh, insurance company, some of them are very sophisticated. Some of them are at a basic level because it is their first and early investments. And, you know, ours is an industry, Shireen, which takes seven to eight years before you can get comfortable with a fund. Given that the AIF industry itself is some 10 plus mm -hmm. years old, 15, 20 years, if you take BCF uh, regime, we are still at an early stage of development. So keeping that in mind, especially for pension funds, especially for PFRDA, where 90% of the PFRDA pool is the public pool, a government servant pool, only 10% is private. It is important that we create an architecture of fund of funds, experts who can do the evaluation, mm. select the funds, basis a very professional approach, and then allocate money to them. SIDB and State Bank have been two great examples, and to an extent, NIF also. These are organizations that have learned to understand smaller funds, smaller VC funds, private equity funds, debt. Uh, venture debt or really benzenine debt funds and being able to allocate money to them. So I just want to bring to attention out of the 7 lakh crore in the AIF, about 60% is Indian, 40% is domestic. But what Vineet said, 80% of the total invested in India, which includes the foreign funds. So if you take our usual number of say 5 billion or 6 billion or whatever number we want and call it 50, 60 uh, lakh crore, uh, fifth, whatever, uh, 5, 6 lakh crore, in that 80% is foreign. So I want to basically say that this fund of funds was mm. announced very unambiguously last year by the finance minister. Madam finance minister talked about blended fund of funds and sector focused as well. Agri, deep tech, rural, et cetera. Creating that fund of fund mm. architecture mm. where PF and EPFO can put money is a single point solution where the central government can make a difference because this comes under the control of the central government. This is not a SEBI rule or any such thing. So let's go back to the key accelerants that you believe the budget can really move the needle on. So a couple of things. Sorry about it. Uh, the technology decided to 
to fire at the right moment when I started speaking. So a couple of things. One is the fact that, um, you know, for startups, one of the key things is, is going to be the, the uh, talent uh, and keeping the talent. The ESOP regime in India is still not very, very conducive for, for talent acquisition and retention. The tax laws um, should, as mm. far as ESOP goes, you know, this double taxation and uh, paying taxes much before you have you realize the, the this, especially in an uncertain environment, is is a double whammy for most employees. So I think that whole ESOP regime, um, the taxation on ESOP should get far more uh, friendlier. Uh, that should become a tool for startups, a powerful tool for startups to to get the best talent. And if that can happen itself, that would be a great, uh, this is one. Uh, the second is ease of doing business. Still, while it has eased quite a lot, I think that ease of doing business should be further streamlined for them. The Companies Act and the whole uh, taxation uh, regime is still not very, uh, startup friendly. That's the second one. The third one is from the mm. fact that uh, the the five year, you know, that ATIAC, which is five years, should be extended to ten years. In the first five years, you know, the exemption hardly plays out in very very few cases. So to mm. ensure that the startups do get a much wide, longer period to actually get the benefit of uh, that section, it should be extended to at least 10 years, is what I would think is the fact. Vineet Rai, let me pick up on the point that Rema made, and you know, she's preempted. she's preempted what I was going to address with each of you. Uh, this, this is a comment that's coming in from phone pay on moving the domicile from Singapore to India. Uh, Samir Nigam saying that uh, our investors have had to pay at least 8,000 crore rupees of taxes due to the domicile shift to India. This is also like a capital gain transaction. This is a very stiff shock. Sanjeev Bhikchandani tweeting saying, Phone pay CEO Samir Nigam estimates that at least 20 unicorns want to flip back to India if regulations enable it. The government needs to launch a Ghar Vapsi program for flipped startups. Vineet, first, how do you get people not to move out to India? Second, how do you get people to move back to India? I think. Uh, uh... I think these are very basic and very important things that the government uh, can actually make a big difference on. Uh, beyond what uh, Gopal, me, and Rima are talking about, what has happened with us as investors. Uh, but I think there is a significant value creation that can happen as uh, the startup ecosystem evolves, uh, both because India is actually a large economy and India is paying a reasonably high uh, valuation in case you actually list your companies, you're able to build up very good business model and you're able to list and go private, uh, it can create significant value, which actually is a reasonable uh, uh, reasonable reason for people to actually flip back to India. Now, so there are incentives, but then there are costs being imposed uh, because we seem to probably want to make money too early. Uh, I think 8,000 crore is a very nice number, actually, uh, frankly, but there is no real capital gains taking place. And this issue actually persists significantly within um, M&A that takes place in India. So it's not just about companies flipping from outside into India. This is actually a serious problem.